Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the third in the Sundown series brought to you by the Queensland Seafood Marketers Association and the FRDC. I'm Ben Hale from the QSMA and uh, joining me today uh, is Patrick Hone to host the session um, with uh, some fantastic insights coming from Nielsen, from Melanie Norris and Neil Moody, who are going to share with us uh, all sorts of consumer insights uh, into the seafood business. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you want to ask a question, just use the chat button. Um, this uh, session is being recorded as well, but uh, none of your faces in terms of the attendees will be shown. Um, uh, so um, it'll just be the faces of our panelists and their presentations that we'll see. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to Patrick Hine from the FRDC to welcome our guests for the QSMA uh, FRDC Sundowner Sessions. Patrick. Uh, thank you, Ben. And, and look, thank you for everyone to come in. And I'm sure today's uh, third in our sessions on uh, the Sundowner series is going to be as informative as the last two sessions, which have been just uh, great viewing. So uh, um, without too much um, uh, commentary, I'll just make a couple of comments. Um, uh, first of all, uh, FRDC has been working with Nielsen's for some time and uh, uh, as a company they've provided uh, great insight for us in a range of our, our research projects. Uh, most notably, as probably many people know in our, the work that we've been doing with the Love Australian Prawn work, but in many other components of our work. And uh, um, we have been trying to provide that insight during these very difficult times as we've been going through. Uh, this pandemic and uh, it's a delight today to have Melanie and Neil to share their insights and uh, they couldn't have done a better job of choosing a title because right now everyone out there is trying to think through how to navigate these waters. Um, it is not easy uh, and the insights that Melanie and Neil today I hope will provide you the sorts of information to make good business decisions. Um, so Melanie, Melanie Norris, uh, Melanie is uh, in charge of uh, Nielsen's Fresh Analytics Group. Uh, that's very op for us at fisheries and seafood because we always think of ourselves as the fresh seafood people and fresh is very important to seafood as a category. Uh, so it's great to have you along, Melanie. And then we've got Neil. Neil's the commercial manager for commercial partners at Nielsen, uh, looking to, to make sure that he's, the clients that Nielsen works with get the sort of commercial solutions uh, that they need to make their job and their own business thrive in these difficult times. Um, the proceeds today, uh, Melanie and, and uh, Neil are gonna go through uh, three components to their, their talk today. And at the end, we'll have a question and answer. And I really encourage everyone to get onto that chat function and start uh, pumping in those questions and things. And if there's something we can't answer today, I'm sure we can go offline later and make sure that we get the response that you need to make uh, the decisions you're looking for. So. Uh, Without any further ado, I'm going to pass over to uh, Melanie. I believe Melanie's going to start. Thank you, Melanie. Thanks, Patrick. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, I am about to share a presentation here today. Okay. All right. Thank you, Neil. So, Thanks to FRDC and Queensland Seafood Marketers for their support in sharing these consumer insights with you today. Neil, if we could go to the next one. Today we're going to take a look at consumer behaviour, as Patrick said, and how it's changed with the onset of COVID. We're going to zoom out and take a look at the macro grocery picture before zooming back in to focus on seafood. And then we're going to spend some time on what comes next and taking a look at the opportunities and any risks we see. Just note that the basis of the data in today's presentation is Nielsen Home Scan data, which is a measure of take home consumer sales. And Neil is coming to you from Melbourne, where those four walls are starting to look awfully familiar, while I'm coming to you from Sydney, where I've come into the office for the first time in eight months in an attempt to try and find a peaceful spot without dogs and children. So let's head into the insights. Reminding ourselves of where we are to date. So when we look at the growth trajectory over the past few months, we can see that fresh seafood in the lighter blue there is following a similar pattern to total grocery with a new normal of increased at-home food consumption driven by a reduction in out-of-home 
food service consumption in combination with the majority of the population starting to work in their home offices for some or all of the time. And as I mentioned, I'm still there working in my office, as are many people, my home office, sorry, as are many people I talk to. So we can see the huge pantry stocking peak in March, and then our total grocery growth has remained elevated, albeit stabilised in the past few months, while fresh seafood is flourishing as households treat themselves to a healthy take-home protein option. And interestingly, this trend in fresh seafood growth that we're seeing here is really echoed in the US, where fresh seafood at the moment is growing at 29% in the past four weeks. So it's happening around the world. I mentioned the uh, reduction in restaurant eating and eating out. So Nielsen's partnership with Unigroup allows us to have a view of the impact of COVID from a food for service perspective. When we look at the end of May, data to the end of May, we can see that restaurants declined 73% in dollar sales. And this was picked up by grocery, but we also saw significant growth coming from meal kits and food delivery services such as Uber Eats and Deliveroo, et cetera. The main driver behind these food delivery options was actually convenience, um, but also a quarter of respondents had the rather more altruistic desire to help local businesses coming through. Now that restrictions have been eased in many states, we are seeing a move back in spend towards restaurants. However, the COVID space and cleaning requirements mean that restaurants have not gone back to their pre-COVID levels. And as we've seen, grocery remains elevated. Let's look into some consumer consumption changes in a bit more detail. So the onset of COVID, we really noticed the rise of locals. So this is boosted by people working from home, as I mentioned, and in some instances supported by marketing. We really saw the rise of fishmongers, greengrocers, butchers, and independent su supermarkets more than ever before. With many out of stocks and a new way of living, consumers turned towards technology and retailers, retailers that were able to pivot quickly to meet the demand in this area were able to grab market share. We saw on the prior slide the growth of food box and meal kit solutions, and these players were able to grab some market share while Coles and Woolies withdrew from e-commerce for a short period in April to regroup and manage the supply. While we're in the thick of COVID, many retailers cut promotions in an attempt to manage supply. And at the moment, although promotional programs have come back in to many retailers, the level of promotion has not returned to pre-COVID levels. One thing we've noticed is that in an uncertain time, shoppers seek trusted brands and trusted suppliers. So consumers who are financially constrained are going to be less likely to try new things and try new brands. And post-COVID, we really notice the polarization of shoppers into two groups. So as I mentioned, those who've been financially impacted by COVID and those who've not been. So our insulated and constrained spenders. The insulated spenders typically have more discretionary income than they've had before, as their travel and eating out is restricted. And while we anticipate the group of constrained shoppers growing, as many of the wage furloughs that have been put in place by the government have been reduced. So when we look at the Global Consumer Confidence Index and our index here in Australia, we can see that COVID has seen the sharpest dive in consumer confidence in the past 15 years. And the interesting thing to note here for me is despite the relatively good management of COVID and the economy by the Australian government, it's interesting to see that we're still sitting below the global Average. So layoffs in the travel industry, food service in particular, have been prominent in the media and this is contributing towards that confidence level. If we take a look at the drivers of consumer confidence, we can see Neil. Can we go to the next? Yeah. We can see that amid a health crisis, you may expect that health will be the number one, um, the number one concern. But we can see here economy still topping, but health is number two, 
with job security coming in at number three. And less important concerns have seen small movements when we look at this. So concern about global warming fell by five points from 12 in Q4, 19 to seven in Q2. Um, and work-life balance, increasing food prices, also a concern, but not dominating concerns. So driving a lot of this concern and a lot of this uncertainty is unemployment. And something that's very concerning to me is the idea of this youth unemployment that's going to become more and more evident. So we have you know, the concept of youth living at home for longer and deferring more of those life decisions, such as going to study, such as travel, such as marriage, etc., And that will in turn change the shopping baskets we see as youth stay at home for longer, we'll see more multi-generational households. And again, changing the shopping basket and the composition of what they're purchasing in store. So this is scary for me in particular because I have three children and I'm not looking forward to the concept of them staying at home long-term. So what lies ahead? In summary, consumers are going to need to do more with less. In terms of science, it tells us to take 66 days to form a new habit. And the changes that we've seen during COVID of households eating more at home, baking more at home, eating out less, and recalibrating their basket spend to have more of a focus on fresh, look here to stay. We've spoken already about two groups of shoppers, constrained and insulated spenders, and eating from home will be key to both groups. However, value will be the key proposition for constrained spenders, while convenience will drive insulated. During these uncertain times, both groups will look for permissible treats. And there's a role for suppliers to cater for both groups. I'm going to hand over to Neil to take you into a deeper dive into looking at seafood trends during this time. Ah, I'm hoping everyone can hear me. So thanks very much, Mel. Uh, as you can see, I am working from home. I am uh, not able to, uh, <laughs> to join the, uh, the office brigade like my colleague in Sydney. However, we are making the best of what we can uh, with uh, what we have. So uh, I'll be talking to you now a bit more about seafood and what's happening in the seafood landscape and why this matters. And I guess I'll be talking primarily about in-home consumption because uh, uh, that's really where this data is pulling from. Our home scan panel is looking at the in-home behavior of consumers. And we've been working with the FIDC uh, for quite a while in looking at these trends. So I'll take you through, as Mel said, into a bit of a deep dive into seafood and uh, we'll look at the dynamics happening there. So in the first instance, Mel talked about the recalibration of baskets where people are looking to have more fresh food. And uh, we see that chilled seafood is actually now in the top 10 in terms of its growth contribution. So that's a pretty significant move. It's typically in the uh, top 20. And uh, in terms of growth contribution, we're talking about actual value sales making up total FMCG growth uh, within the last quarter. So this is a pretty notable move. And it's something where we do see indulgent categories uh, creeping back up the rankings as well. But uh, we see a lot of fresh in the uh, top 10 there, including seafood. So a really positive view of people looking to balance their health and well-being with a bit of indulgence in terms of this ranking. Now we're going to take a little bit of a view of uh, seafood across the total store. So here we're looking at uh, fresh, frozen and canned and we can see in light blue on the right hand side 
the last 52 weeks growth has been pretty strong across all three formats. So double digit growth uh, for all of these, but we do see frozen actually outperforming fresh and canned during that time. Now in the last uh, 12 weeks in dark blue, we see canned growth is a little bit more subdued and that's really a product of less convenience snacking and less office lunch occasions. Uh, as COVID's really hit, but uh, fresh and frozen are really growing very, very strongly, both around 25% versus year ago. So a very positive story for seafood when we talk about in-home uh, retail sales and consumption. Uh, now, when we look at different channels, uh, we split, this by, split these by supermarkets and also by fishmongers. And we can see that fishmongers growth is outpacing supermarkets at the moment. And this has been a, uh, a bit of a trend for the last, uh, uh, the last couple of periods. But in the last four weeks, uh, we see that growth is uh, just ahead of supermarkets. But whilst fishmongers do have a stronghold within seafood sales and a speciality, uh, supermarkets still represent more than 80% of sales. So, there's a risk if you are outside of that space of not being able to capture some of the strong growth that's seen in the retail market for seafood at the moment. Uh, now looking across regions, uh, we see that uh, across uh, non-restricted states, there's a real shift back towards, uh, back towards food service and restaurants. The growth is more subdued in terms of supermarket sales for fish and seafood. Uh, but what we do notice is very strong sales in Victoria where there are quite a few restrictions. And I guess other states like New South Wales and Queensland, the real positive signs are that despite reduced restrictions or almost uh, back to normal, uh, uh, normal times in terms of being able to go out to restaurants and uh, get takeaway, there's still very strong growth coming through those two states as well. So that's another really positive sign for seafood overall is the increased level of in-home consumption across regions, both affected and less affected from co uh, by COVID. And uh, as Patrick mentioned up front, you know, fresh is really critical to the seafood industry. And we see fresh making up 70% of sales overall for uh, fish and seafood in the last year. But we do note that frozen has been increasing and this has been especially prevalent in, since March when we saw a lot of panic buying and a real shift in behaviour on the back of COVID when it uh, started to really bite. So looking now at a slightly trended view, we can see in this highlighted red area, uh, a big spike in frozen sales that happened around March. And this is when COVID really hit and the restrictions were really in full force. So frozen sales at that time represented almost 50% share of overall fish and seafood sales during that time, which is pretty significant and had never been seen before. Now, whilst uh, this uh, share of frozen had reduced just after that when panic buying eased, we have seen a slight uptick as this has continued over consecutive periods uh, to slightly increase in share of trade. And this is happening as frozen is growing faster than fresh at this time. But as mentioned, fresh is still the dominant, uh, the dominant area for seafood, but it's a bit of a watch out in terms of uh, what shoppers are actually picking up and how shoppers demand is being met in more detail by frozen. One of the other elements that we've seen that's been a really big shift in consumer behavior is online sales. So when we look at grocery, typically for FMCG products, uh, we can say that uh, online has not been particularly strong or particularly well developed in the Australian market. It's been typically representing four to 5% of sales overall. However, in the 12 weeks to uh, August, uh, we've seen uh, supermarkets, uh, sorry, we've seen online now representing about 8% share of grocery trade. So that's quite a significant change as people look to have their needs met by online to manage out of stocks and to meet their requirements for the product they were looking for. 
uh, but it's also uh, to uh, meet requirements as they've been more restricted in movement for where they can shop and how. Seafood has also seen a similar shift. So we can see that, that increase in online sales and to be honest, a lot of it's through the majors who dominate online, but it's also through specialty retail. Uh, we can see that shift up, especially over the last few months and more households coming into seafood uh, and bringing its share of trade uh, out of the total market up to over 5% share of trade. So uh, that's quite a big shift. And we expect that that to continue as people become more uh, ingrained with that kind of behavior and more confident with the offer and how it's meeting their needs. Another thing that we've really noted is around format. So when we look at seafood sales, we look at the breakout of fresh uh, random weight products sold behind the deli counter typically, and also uh, pre-packed, so map uh, product. And we've seen a huge shift in map sales that have been coming through in supermarkets, especially again around that March period. But when we compare versus uh, pre-COVID times, uh, a much bigger shift to that. And a lot of that's potentially due to the perceived safety, but also the convenience of pre-packed product in a COVID environment. And now taking a quick look across species, salmon and prawns really dominate uh, seafood sales. They represent approximately 60% of sales overall. And in the last year, uh, we've seen continued strong growth from sales uh, from salmon and from prawns. But what we've also seen is an increase in other fish types. So product like barramundi, white fish, and also other species seeing really strong growth. And a lot of this has come anecdotally as people haven't been able to go out to restaurants, but in looking to change up their consumption and try something different, people have been more open to expanding their repertoire, to try new recipes and changing up family meal times uh, to try to offer something different. So this is a really strong trend in in-home retail consumption that we're seeing. And we do expect that to continue as people get more confident with how they're cooking and the types of fish and seafood that they're cooking with. We thought it would be good to provide a comparison as well around what seafood offers retailers relative to other proteins. So seafood indexes really strongly in terms of its value compared to meat on average. It's almost two times uh, greater value than meat on average. And this means that consumers are effectively trading up when they choose seafood over another type of protein within a supermarket. So, this is something that is really important for retailers. Uh, any offer or opportunity to uh, trade consumers up means that helps build basket value. And retailers are really interested in that because it helps drive top line sales growth. So when we look at seafood, it is a premium at a pre selling at a premium relative to other proteins. And this is offering scope for trading consumers up. But it should be noted that in the context of constrained and insulated spenders, that it's important to know uh, where value uh, lies. And so with other uh, proteins such as beef or with chicken, for example, there's many different forms or uh, types of uh, offer that you can get, which potentially meet uh, value conscious shoppers needs such as mince or whole roast chicken, which typically has a lower average price per volume than certain other cuts. And with seafood, the types of offers that we have available, it's probably important to consider what are the value as well as the premium offers that are available to supermarkets to sell and for supermarkets to be able to market both value and the option to trade up consumers based on what kind of shopper profile they match. Now, something we wanted to call out was we have talked a little bit about the rise of frozen and we're seeing that become a little bit more of a feature of purchasing in the COVID period. Um, probably of note is whilst we have a similar proportion of frozen versus fresh growth contributors 
period on period, we are seeing a really sharp rise in frozen prawn growth, and that's topping out the growth contributors in the uh, current COVID period over the last 12 weeks. The reason why I think that's really important to call out is there's a bit of a risk. Uh, whilst fresh prawns make up 70% of prawn sales uh, and frozen represent about 30, that share is growing. And we know that a lot of frozen prawn sales are actually of imported product. So to the local industry, that does represent a bit of a concern and a bit of a watch out in the retail space. But when I talk about household consumption, you know, we are seeing a lot of really positive trends, but it's not just top line sales and uh, volume uh, trends that we can see utilizing the Nielsen home scan data. We can also understand the consumer drivers of those trends. So uh, we're able to see whether there are changing uh, uh, consumer drivers, such as more households buying, and how frequently they purchase, whether they're consuming more. And of note is that we are seeing more households buying across different formats of seafood and different species. So uh, when we talk about households buying, we're talking about household penetration, which is effectively the percentage of households where people have bought that product into the home. So we can see for salmon, uh, which is uh, the I guess the largest share of uh, seafood sales overall, over 50% of households are buying fresh salmon each year. And that that's growing, it's up 1.9 points or percentage points versus a year ago. Uh, frozen is also growing quite strongly. We see the same trend for frozen and fresh prawns, with fresh prawns reaching 37% of Australian households. And we see fresh and frozen barramundi also in growth, as well as fresh white fish. So really positive trend in terms of more seafood coming into more households every year. And we also see increasing household consumption. So when we're talking about consumption here, we're talking about average household consumption in kilos. So uh, uh, we're looking at the average weight of purchase and consumption for products like salmon, prawns, barramundi and whitefish, all growing year on year. Uh, and uh, that's a really fantastic uh, trend and something which, whilst it might not make up fully for any reduction in out-of-home consumption across restaurants and food service, it is a really positive trend. And it's one that we expect to continue, as I said, as more people get comfortable uh, eating more seafood as part of their weekly and yearly uh, uh, average, and also uh, start getting more confident with different types of seafood preparation and different recipes. So now I'm going to hand back to Mel, uh, and I'll, Mel and I will both take you through a little bit more about what next, see where we can take advantage of some of these trends, and also talk a little bit about the risks and opportunities as we look to better meet consumer needs. Thanks, Neil. Thanks for that. So we've talked a lot about e-commerce and, and online shopping in today's uh, presentation, but just wanted to dwell on some other responses we've seen with online because online in itself is not necessarily gaining retailers additional value, but the play is gaining them extra share. I think that's the, the key point with online. It's a market share gain strategy. So once you've got your list with a certain retailer, you're probably going to stick with that retailer for online shopping. You're not going to change and recreate your list. Similarly with HelloFresh, Marley Spoon, those sorts of offers, being in for the longer term and the longer haul gives you benefits. So it's a real market share play that we see. And, you know, example there of Providor in Melbourne is a, a real example of where some, someone from the food service industry really move quickly and pivoted quickly and flex their service methods so that they could deliver restaurant quality meal kits um, within Melbourne. I'm sure we've got Sydney equivalents and equivalents all over Australia. Taking a look at some more of the opportunities that we see. Oh yes, this is the seafood one, sorry. Sorry, Mel, skip the head. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> So, 
uh, we did see that alongside some of those uh, existing players who were really set up uh, well as part of the COVID, uh, as uh, I guess as COVID hit, uh, with online distribution already set up or direct to consumer, such as Marley Spoon and HelloFresh, where they have a distribution model that's really benefited from the COVID restrictions. Um, not everyone was set up to respond as quickly, but we did see Provador as an example, uh, supporting food service. And we've seen the seafood industry also respond really uh, quickly and flex their service model uh, in ways that, uh, you know, have had to take place uh, to make up for uh, lost demand from export and also for food service. So some great examples were red, cor uh, red coral seafood, which I'm aware had set up very quickly uh, and very early to move to uh, online and home delivery, uh, groups like uh, Ocean Made and a number of different groups across states also flexing their model and working out different ways to both uh, be online, uh, set uh, home delivery up so that they could react in a uh, really quick way to consumers who couldn't actually get to their stores because of restrictions in movement and also retail restrictions about how they could open. So it's definitely been a time of huge challenge, uh, but we can see that there's definitely the kernels of some differentiated uh, growth opportunities and ways to reach consumers, um, uh, which have already started to happen. And when we look at risks and opportunities, some things that we wanted to leave you with today were really understanding, I guess, some of the key areas that uh, uh, should be a focus for the industry. And we believe we really support uh, in the longer term, uh, stronger growth across a number of different industry players. So as mentioned, supermarkets are a critical part of this with more than 80% of sales going through uh, retail uh, uh, supermarket space. This is a really critical channel both for uh, sales volume and for uh, selling different product, but it's also a really important part of connecting with your consumers because there's so many opportunities with people shopping in retailers every week and sometimes more than one time per week to actually disrupt and engage and look to, uh, uh, to drive increased consumption through that channel. So it's an important thing to do, uh, to work with retailers as part of the strategy, but to do so and to be part of those conversations, you really need to understand the trends and some of the dynamics happening within the market to be able to effectively represent how you see supermarkets benefiting from, uh, from seafood and selling more seafood, trading consumers up, offering more varieties and options for accessing that kind of produce. And direct-to-consumer uh, models, such as meal kits and food boxes, as we've seen, they have had explosive growth during this period. Making sure your products are featured um, in these channels will really get you in front of many more consumers. Also supporting recipe creation ideas, both with these players, but also with the traditional bricks and mortar retailers. Um, always gonna help greater take up of at-home cooking and really our opportunities for growth. And then we've already seen some of the uh, expansion into online starting to take place. And uh, we've seen some of the education piece required uh, to try to do that effectively in uh, one of the previous uh, sundowner sessions with Ben, which was hosted around setting an, up an online store, marketing and uh, directly uh, engaging consumers in an online what, uh, platform. And we've seen the response of many industry players uh, looking to flex their model and become more agile in the face of uh, these kind of restrictions on trade. And this is really important to do both as a communication tool, uh, as a way to differentiate and also uh, alter your distribution channels so that if you do lose in one area, you can gain in another which is really, really critical as whilst we're seeing, for example, uh, most states uh, opening back up again, and even Victoria looking slightly more positive with recent numbers, there is always a chance that there might be either a rebound or something else comes up. And it's about positioning 
the industry for future growth and to lessen the impact of any future challenges. So these are key areas that we think uh, will really set up the industry for success and help mitigate that if there's further challenges in the future. In summary, we've seen fundamental shifts in the retail space, in the retail space, sorry, and in consumer behaviour driven by COVID, and many of those changes we expect to carry on in the medium to long term. The take-home seafood landscape is looking positive as more people are consuming seafood in the last year and they're increasing their repertoire of seafood species eaten at home, which is great to see. We need to remember that while bricks and mortar is still the majority of sales, online fresh seafood growth has been accelerated by COVID and there's an opportunity there to engage in those direct-to-consumer models um, by either partnering with other retailers, you know, going it alone with some of the excellent advice we've seen in Ben Howe's webinar a few weeks ago. We've seen a move towards pre-packed map seafood for supermarkets, which is also echoed in fresh produce and possibly more appealing to those shoppers who want to limit their time that they spend in store and or purchase online. Consumers are moving into two groups, strained and our insulated consumers. And we need to ensure we have a clear offer for both of those groups. So while there are still challenges, definitely great opportunities to engage more strongly in the retail space and to find different paths into consumers' homes and ultimately onto their plates. Now I'm gonna hand back to Patrick. I can see some great questions coming through on the chat there. Um, so Patrick, over to you. I think you're still on mute, Patrick. Uh, I did unmute myself and I think Ben muted me. Uh, so anyway, just saying, um, uh, Neil and Melanie, thanks, a great job. And yes, uh, we started to get questions in the um, chat function. So if anybody wants to see that chat, as uh, said at the beginning, hit the little chat button down the bottom. Uh, or if you're in your, an Apple computer, I can't tell you. Um, but I'm sure Ben could give us a little thing about how to do that as well. Um, so um, I think that the question everyone's trying to find out, I'm looking at some of the questions there, there's this issue about so the market's changed, will it stay changed? And how can seafood lock in the change? So, um, Melanie or Neil, some view, I think you were giving us some hints about what we could do uh, to make sure that we build on the, uh, the improvements we've seen. But just some thoughts on, you know, what can the industry do to, to not only uh, rebuild its food service market, but uh, um, ensure that the gains it's made in the retail uh, area stay locked in for the future? Uh, that's a great question. And to a degree, um, we would hope that alongside uh, uh, people being able to go back out to restaurants again, that uh, that any marketing activity and I guess any of the uh, types of experimentation that had been done in this current COVID time uh, would really translate into some change behavior. And Mel talked about that in terms of, you know, uh, people sort of building uh, these habits. And so uh, this is a time in which seafood has become more commonplace uh, in home. And I think that's one of the elements where uh, it's increasing frequency of purchase and average consumption uh, should hopefully translate into uh, maintaining and holding some of that level of growth uh, into the future. So, but I do think it's important not to take, uh, take that for granted and that there's opportunities to engage retailers more strongly to make increases in terms of its prominence and its marketing uh, and I guess the ability to disrupt shoppers as opportunities to maintain that level of growth in the longer term. I don't know if you would agree with that, Mel, or have some further points to comment there? Yeah, look, I think um, in terms of consolidating the space for the future, yes, you know, there will be a move back towards food service, but I do believe that this habit of eating more at home will stay, as I mentioned, I think the habit is formed. 
And I guess to consolidate the position of seafood in that is just to really focus on those two offers. So treating ourselves in a food service way at home with those you know, luxurious seafood protein options, but also perhaps looking to the repertoire of seafood to see some of those more value cuts and the difference we can make in educating consumers into how to cook those and how to prepare those at home. Uh, thanks for that. Um, Miles Toomey had a question, so, uh, a good question. So it's, it was quite fascinating to see how well the fishmongers have done, but quite rightly you've said don't give up on the supermarkets. Um, but the question really is there, the question that's in the chat there is, uh, what's the look on fresh only for the two, uh, the split? Do we have any data on that? Well, we might have to look at that and uh, just check what that uh, performance looks like. Um, given that uh, frozen is probably a little bit more prevalent in supermarkets, I'd suggest that just fresh only would maybe have, uh, uh, would maybe show that uh, fishmongers are a little further ahead in terms of current growth rates as well. And fresh dominates. So yeah, you've, you've got the same trend, but a bit stronger, I'd say. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking for, uh, and while people are just looking to put questions, I'll just pose another question for you. I, I found it fascinating, I think it was Melanie made the comment that it takes about 66 days uh, to form a habit. And I, I think, you know, the insight in this almost experiment called COVID is, is, is explaining to us how you can actually change habit, habits. And obviously cooking at home is a new habit for some people. Um, uh, so in terms of, um, uh, what the seafood can, industry can do and what are the p positive habit, habits we could maybe get out of uh, the information that you've got. Have you got any insights into those positive? You've talked about convenience. You've talked about a healthy, eating healthy lifestyle. You've talked about that we're a unit protein, which is quite expensive uh, compared to the other meat index. So I suppose, you know, it's, it's how can we um, build the value proposition uh, to build in the next habit. So if the habit is to eat more seafood, the question is, what's the next uh, area that maybe we could focus on? What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you go with that one, Neil. <laughs> I mean, that's a, a really uh, a big question. It's, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think where to start. <laughs> maybe I can, I can pop in. I think one of the questions that Ben raised actually falls in nicely with this. And Ben mentioned that, you know, before COVID, we were expect, we were experiencing a little bit of a shift towards more flexitarian, yes. healthier eating. And you, you've got to hope that with, you know, health being the number two concerns for consumers, that seafood has a really big pay, place to, to um, play in that space. So that continued health and well-being option. But also, I think, you know, COVID has raised concerns to people about their food and where they come from. And we're very lucky in Australia to have so much local produce and local um, seafood and, and fisheries and our, even our meat is, you know, very locally produced. But I think continuing to reinforce that to consumers, because even though in the industry we, we know it well, it's not always evident to consumers and always known to them. Mm. Two points I'd make, Neil. I'm not sure if you've got anything you'd like to add to that. No, I think that's a really good point. And I guess there's shifting behaviour that's happening where, I guess, with not being able to do as many things and they have more restrictions, people have become a little bit more inwardly focused, perhaps. So, you know, doing better for yourself and for others. There's been a lot of people, um, you know, I guess, focused on healthier eating. And that has been a bit of a trend that's coming through. Uh, that uh, probably for the last couple of years, um, but I do believe it has accelerated that. So if uh, people uh, maintain that same level of focus, um, then we could really see that uh, there's a great place for seafood to be, I guess, marketed as a great healthy option. Um, yeah. And well, The other thing to be reminded, Neil, is that, you know, we've got this repertoire of meals. We're having more of that repertoire at home. So... I mean, all proteins have seen growth in this time, even plant-based, but particularly beef, lamb, they've all seen growth, pork. Seafood has seen quite significant growth. And I guess it's just, what's the repertoire of that weekly meal? If, I'm, if I used to eat three meals out and now I have one Deliveroo and I eat the rest at home, then, you know, there's an option to fill that repertoire, I think. 
And, and so maybe we'll just uh, test a little things. So you talked about the online has been quite a strong change that we've seen. And you talked about Deliveroo and, and the different uh, mechanisms about how that food gets to consumers. Um, in terms of seafood, in terms of how you actually position yourself, Ben talked about how we can create our own little online platforms, but, but from your data and the information that you're seeing, obviously it's a growth market. But again, people, I suppose, are a bit nervous in the seafood market if you start to gear up with all your packaging and things and then find that it suddenly dissipates because suddenly everyone goes back to the restaurant. I suppose the question is, do you see the online as being something that we're going to see continuing? Or do you think it will everyone will revert back to type as soon as they're allowed to get back into supermarkets? I think it's going to continue, as I mentioned, because you're going to have financial constraint for so many consumers. So this eating from home, we are in a recession and, and food and supermarkets and eating from home is the one, one of the areas that always does well in a recession. So I think we're going to see this trend for quite some time. Yes, there's a gradual shift back, but I don't know if you've tried to eat out recently, Patrick. I've been trying to eat out a few times. It's such a pain to make a reservation. You basically have to pay and put money down even to get a restaurant reservation. So for many people, that's off-putting. So I do think online will continue. But I think one thing we've learned from this crisis is the need for all of our business models to be flexible. If we don't have flexibility, we are going to be stuck in the future because things have changed very quickly in the past few months. And um, we never know what's around the corner. Uh, one other thing on that point, uh, Patrick, is that uh, whilst we might see uh, maybe a slight lessening in terms of the growth, I do think the shift in terms of the behaviour will uh, be maintained and that retailers are putting more focus in that area. Um, and probably most notably, uh, one of the major retailers is looking at, uh, you know, uh, food boxes or basics as a way for people to manage their budgets. So they know that it's not just convenience, but it's also value that needs to factor into online and, uh, and uh, essentially marketing through their online platform to do that. So uh, you can see that's a bit of a shift that's both a response to consumer need as well as a way to market the platform and uh, the channel um, to try to meet those convenience and value needs. So whilst there's constrained spenders in there uh, in the market, uh, we should probably expect to see more of this and uh, that it will be something where consumers are looking for, you know, something more uh, to meet their needs. So communicating with them in that way. Uh, that can definitely be a, a good option, saving them trips out and uh, also hopefully saving them money. Um, uh, look, I think online, because I, I can conf agree with you, I think online is just amazing because I, I know home here, we, I never thought we'd be buying so much online food. Uh, it changed our lifestyle. And I have to say the seafood offerings are suddenly getting, uh, and I'm, you're not meant to talk about brands here, but... Uh, and that Joe Rusk goes on, but we're getting some amazing barramundi delivered home at the moment, which I'm just loving. Uh, for other products uh, and really affordable prices, that's what I'm finding. I, it's, it's quite competitive. Um, but I think I'll just move on. You, you gave us a little call out about maybe the issue around prawns and that change, you know, between one period and the next. And you said prawns should look at the uh, issue about the frozen category increasing because it, it does uh, tend to um, structure itself around the imported product. And we talked about Australian product here. Um, are there any other products? I mean, and, and what what are we, are we seeing any of those other structural changes? Uh, because obviously we're very supportive of Australian seafood. So uh, keen to understand what maybe some of the messaging we're getting there through uh, that change in consumer uh, buying. Well, I don't have a lot of detail there, apart from observing that trend, but it's potentially a combination of some imported product to meet uh, supply uh, or demand. It could be a little bit expanded offerings around uh, frozen product in prepackaged format. So there may be instances where, you know, I guess it's meeting a need uh, expansion of the freezer section next to the deli as a convenience offer. And as Mel mentioned, you know, um, pre-packed product and the capacity to just pick that up and spend less time in store. So it's a convenience option as well that I think has become a little bit more magnified. So, you know, those are some key, I guess, elements. 
um, that I would highlight as maybe being factors for why frozen has increased, as well as the option to buy a little bit more and keep it in the freezer um, for um, stocking up if people are shopping a little less frequently at the moment and visiting stores as a way to manage risk from a COVID perspective. Um, uh, ben, I'm noticing we're getting into the last 10 minutes. Um, I'm happy if you want to raise your question, but I do have one very important question. Uh, seafood is often seen as, as the uh, uh, choice, as you said, to celebrate, to have special events. We're coming up to uh, Christmas, but we're hoping Melbourne Cup Day is going to be an amazing day for prawns, aren't we, Ben? Uh, always. And uh, nothing better than to share a, a Holden win on Bathurst than a good prawn. Uh, so, uh, And of course, when watching State of Origin, tearing some heads off is, is a prerequisite as well. Yes, the, <laughs> yes, that's a very good one. So as we head up into uh, what is undoubtedly normally the seafood um, ultimate time of the year, any view about are we going to see a Christmas like last year or are we going to see a very different Christmas? And if people are going to be buying seafood at Christmas, uh, how are they going to be buying it? Oof. Yeah, I don't know. I might have to hand that over to Mel, who's in the state where they might actually be able to actually have Christmas together with more than five people. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking of Christmas as we've been talking today. Look, I think, I mean, on the one hand, people are going to be looking for a chance to celebrate because, you know, we've, we've had such a, a terrible year in terms of catching up with family and friends. It most probably will be restricted, a bit like Easter was this year, but um, hopefully not as restricted as Easter was this year. So I believe uh, seafood sales were a little bit subdued this year in Easter. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Neil, won't you? I think just a little bit, yes. Yeah. However, I do think, you know, with the, the strength of fishmongers and the strength of the industry behind fishmongers and also supermarkets and these other online channels, there's certainly an opportunity for seafood to make the most of Christmas and really get in there. And I think the key is going to be um, what the offer is, because if people are having smaller groups, then the industry needs to be mindful of that and their offer to consumers. But it could be that that represents a great opportunity in the same way that uh, people are looking to indulge a little bit more. Exactly. And if they don't have capacity to go out or uh, go on holidays and spend as much, then spending on in-home consumption and really treating yourself is a great, uh, a great opportunity right now, sure. uh, which could be uh, strongly marketed to. And you know, maybe there are occasions that people don't think of quite as strongly uh, for seafood, which the communication could be really ramped up at this time to try to drive, you know, a much, much stronger retail response and, uh, and utilise some of those new distribution channels such as online and direct to home, uh, which are already being set up in, uh, in many places. If I may jump in just for, for one second, um, I think there's also another uh, shift or, or characteristic that we're going to see this year that's, and this Christmas that's going to be unique is the fact that we've got about a million Australians who generally travel overseas and visit family around that time. They're not going anywhere. And then they're generally the, you know, that second cohort that's not suffering as badly in the recession. Um, so there's a million extra hungry mouths there looking for something on Christmas day. So I think- We'll be at home eating seafood. As well. <laughs> So I think, you know, I think, Ben, you know, the other the issue that we're, or hopefully the thing that we're going to see is that um, uh, during this period, the offer in retail and fishmongers has broadened. Um, you know, I love the fact that for, for once I can actually buy fresh oysters now at my local supermarket. Never been able to do that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the variety of um, product that's coming out of our, our Commonwealth fisheries and other groups that we haven't seen before. So, you know, building the seafood category is what we're all about. Um, and hopefully that pulls through all the other seafood products. That's what we're, we're trying to do. Um, and I think, you know, I'm hoping that Christmas is going to see a smorgasbord of seafood, uh, not just uh, one particular type of seafood. So it'd be great to see that happen. I think we might wrap up there because we're, we're coming to an end. Uh, uh, I'd really like to thank uh, Neil and Melanie for some great insights. Uh, just to remind everyone, this has been recorded. So if anybody wants to go back later and try and peruse the data, because uh, I'm a bit of a data nerd, as everyone knows, and, and, and I really need to see some of those figures and graphs a little bit more. 
Uh, I do believe um, uh, Pete Horvat at FADC is doing some work at the moment to bring up what we call our COVID special or data uh, that we're working with a whole group of people to bring up some more inf information so that people can make the right business decisions. And we really thank Nielsen's for their help uh, in uh, making sure that we do have the best data that we can provide. Uh, Queensland Seafood Marketers Association, as usual, Marshall, uh, Ben, uh, Jim, somewhere floating in the background. Uh, great to be partnering with you again. Um, and Ben, I'll hand over you and uh, we might wrap up. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, look, now's the time for the plug for next week's session, which is going to be really exciting, um, which is uh, the uh, experts, Ben Van Delden from Head of Agri-Food and, and Circular Economy Advisory at KPMG, as well as Dan Ginger, the Manager of Agri-Food and Access Asia. They're going to be talking about seafood supply chain resilience, levering digital and data for industry growth. So, you know, those themes are continuing, this digital and data driving your business decisions. I can't wait for this one. I, I think there's, I'm going to be able to learn a lot that I can apply in my sort of regular um, duties in with Love Australian Prawns and QSMA. Uh, tell all your friends, I think it's going to be a really great session. It is Monday, October 26th, and uh, that will be the fourth of the sundown sessions, but there is more to come. And remember, if you go to the QSMA website, you can see all of these sessions, plus extra resources uh, that you can access based on that session. So um, check it out at queenslandseafoodmarketers.com.au. And thank you all for attending. Thanks for your questions. And we'll see you next week. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Melanie.